This video is sponsored by Squarespace. You leave the stadium and you want to see the next game. You can't wait for the next game. That's what football should be. And if you can do this very often, then you will be successful 100%. Jurgen Klopp was always very clear about his priorities as a football coach. It was never just about winning. He wanted to do things his way and he wanted to entertain. At Mainz and then at Dortmund, Klopp sought to produce a football that felt authentic, that served his players, but also left an impression on the fans. A football full of unpredictability, of intensity, and football played with heart. And years later at Liverpool, that vision reached its zenith. In both the 18, 19 and 1920 seasons, Liverpool achieved over 90 points in the league, winning the club's first Premier League trophy and the Champions League. And in that period, they only lost four league games and scored over 170 goals. We know they had quality players and clearly Klopp is an exceptional manager, but these kind of numbers suggest something more, something that made this team particularly special. So today I'm exploring the peak of Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool, what made them so devastating, so oppressive to play against, but most of all, so consistently dominant. It took Jurgen Klopp three years to build the Liverpool team he really wanted, a squad that suited the football he believed in. To quote Klopp himself, he wanted his football to be very emotional, very fast, very strong, and not boring. And by the start of the 18-19 season, he had found the perfect formula to make that happen. For me, what defined this team in possession was its sheer unpredictability, the desire to make life uncomfortable for the opponent through different modes of attack. For example, Liverpool were more than capable of a controlled build-up through the thirds. Typically, the front three would narrow and Roberto Firmino would drop deep to create an overload. Then, using the vacated space out wide, Liverpool would push their fullbacks up, Andy Robertson and Trent Alexander-Arnold, both of whom were capable of quality delivery into the box. And you can think of this as Liverpool's basic mode of attack. However, Liverpool were far from dogmatic in their approach play, and much more than most top teams, they were happy to find less controlled routes to goal. For me, this was made possible by the qualities particularly of Sadio Mane and Mo Salah. Channel balls, wide crosses, through balls, even balls over the top, these players were so technically and physically dominant, you could service them from almost anywhere on the pitch. And that made Liverpool much more vertical than most of the teams, often trading controlled possession for forward intent. By far the most significant example of this verticality came in transition situations. When they won the ball back in the middle to front third, Liverpool were single-minded, they wanted to counter-attack immediately. Defend to create chances was one of the core coaching principles. Typically it was Salah that would stay ahead of the ball in Liverpool's defensive shape, and he was often the first or second ball after a turnover, putting him 1v1 with a centre-back. What Klopp and his coaching staff wanted to achieve here was not just a tactic to surprise, but a culture of unpredictability. The more spontaneous you were, the more you could sow doubt in the opposition. And that meant, while Liverpool were certainly structured, there was a sense of freedom within the players' positioning and decision-making. So the midfielders could decide for themselves whether to drop deep or play between the lines. And the forwards were the most free of all, taking up almost any position they wanted across the front line. And this was all part of that coaching culture. Pep Linders, Liverpool assistant coach, said that, for me, football needs this complete freedom, this unpredictability, where the best talents can show their way to attack. But quite surprisingly, this spontaneity was also prevalent in the defensive side of the game. Linders, who had a lot of input in Liverpool's pressing, went on to say this. It's not ABC coaching. We want to be unpredictable. So a lot is about the closest is to be ready to go. We follow with help of the block of center. And you'd see that really often, Liverpool would be in their defensive shape, the front three would be closing off forward passes, and without any real trigger, Mane decides to press. And when he goes, Keita and Milner have to be ready to jump. So it's spontaneity within the principles and culture that the coaching staff have created. But all of this unpredictability, the transitions, the moments of freedom, come at a price. If you watched my last video, we talked about Pep Guardiola and his desire to create the most controlled game possible. That way you could reduce uncertainty and attack and defend in consistent, coachable ways. But it seems like Jurgen Klopp is trying to do the opposite, actively generating unknown, creating game states that can't possibly be coached. So how are Liverpool just as consistent as City while embracing so much uncertainty? First though, football clubs are reliant on the connection with their audience, and the same is true if you're an entrepreneur. 
So if you're growing a brand and want to better engage with your audience, you should check out the sponsors of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform that helps you stand out and succeed online. And it's got all the tools to help you accomplish that in one place. That means creating your website with the, I've got to say, very easy to use Fluid Engine. It's super intuitive to build and stylize your site. But then you know me, I love analytics. And Squarespace also gives you data and insights so you can actually understand where your site visits are coming from, which channels are most effective. And like football analytics, those things are going to give you the edge in the long term. So check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready, you can go to squarespace.com forward slash the purest football for 10% off your first website or domain. Good luck. I know it's not the most important statistic, but I love it when I read after the game that we run more than the, than the opponent. I like this. If somebody tells me after the game, you, know, you run 11 kilometers more than the, than the other team, I, that's, that's good. It's important to acknowledge that Liverpool games were not just chaotic free-for-alls. There was a high degree of pragmatism that accompanied Klopp's heavy metal football. For one, their approach would differ based on game state and opponent. Against weaker opponents, they were generally more controlled, limiting turnovers and racking up high possession, so they could get up the pitch and counter-press in a consistent structure. Five players across the front line, always three behind to counter-press. It was generally against stronger opponents that they were more vertical, and when they were chasing a game that they were more positionally free. And there was a lot of tactical pragmatism too, so while the fullbacks wanted to get forward, they timed their movement to prevent being caught out by an early turnover. That meant often actively holding back, making sure to arrive in space rather than wait in it. Defensively, Liverpool pressed high and really compressed the pitch, making themselves incredibly compact in the middle third, so the vast majority of their defending happened away from their goal. But despite their high line, this team wasn't usually interested in playing an offside trap. If there was an early turnover or their counter press failed, you'd see Liverpool's backline drop, with Van Dijk essentially playing as a sweeper. Even so, it was inevitable that Liverpool had to be prepared for more chaotic games. Their unpredictability on the ball meant that when they did lose it, the conditions weren't always perfect to win it back quickly. Players were out of position, there were big distances between the lines. So how did they account for that? Well, they did it, most of all, by working really hard. Most people cite the front three in terms of their work ethic, and rightfully so. In fact, Linders talks about the front three being responsible for five or six players by pressing with the right angles and chasing the ball with the intent to win it. But you have to remember that behind them, Liverpool's midfield was comprised almost entirely of highly athletic, extremely aggressive footballers, whose main roles weren't creative, but really destructive. And these players were athletic and intelligent enough to make up the meters when the game was in a state of chaos. Which is exactly what happened here, as Jordan Henderson makes up for the poor pressing conditions. And Henderson is a player that some have ridiculed for his apparent technical deficiencies, but he was the heart and soul of this team and set the tone for the culture of hard work. So if the press did get bypassed, players would be prepared to commit themselves out of position. If the counter pressing structure wasn't there, players would sprint back to recover. Everyone was so charged with energy and intensity, they would do whatever they had to to cover ground and win the ball back. And it's easy to see where that energy came from. If you have a big heart, if you really want to, if you want to get there, you will get there. And when you add the individual quality, Van Dijk, who couldn't be beaten in space, Alisson, who made frequent game-winning saves, Liverpool were utterly oppressive to play against. On the surface then, this team looked like the perfect marriage of coaching ideology and player profiles to make it work. But that makes it sound too much like coincidence. Because according to Ralph Ranick, who coached two of Liverpool's front three, none of them were natural ball winners when they came to Europe. They were not the kind of players that everybody said, wow, they are pressing machines. No. So all the things that happened at Liverpool was the job of the coach. And this, I think, sheds light on the real reason for Liverpool's dominance. Beyond tactics, Klopp was able to convince his players of an idea, to infuse them with the motivation to play football his way without compromise. And all along, as we've discussed this team, those two things have always been intertwined the identity behind Klopp's football, and the tactics that make it work. But there's a third element, I think, something I introduced in the very beginning of this video that took this team to a historic level. Tactical things are so important. You cannot win without tactical things, but um, the, 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 the emotion makes the difference. Life in our game, that's important. 
Beyond winning, Jurgen Klopp always wanted to create a spectacle. His motivation isn't just material, it's emotional. To give the fans something to enjoy and invest in, so they couldn't wait for their next game. But it is far from a one-way relationship. Klopp's football, in all its emotion, its intense passion, never denied the human element of the sport. And so, not only did the football create a connection with the audience, but to a degree, it relied on that connection to exist. At its best, Liverpool were an astonishing unity between players and fans, people and place. And that's where I think this team set itself apart. It wasn't just about an incredible coach and quality players. Culturally, historically, there is something about Liverpool, the club and the city, that aligns itself with the passion, intensity and work ethic that Klopp instilled in this group. It's no surprise or coincidence that Anfield became impenetrable, and Liverpool set the record for the most consecutive home wins. In the end then, peak Liverpool was the perfect storm, a harmony between club, players and culture that seeped into every game, and that gave this team a will and energy to compete. And I think that harmony, more than anything else, is what made this Liverpool team so historically dominant. Following Jurgen Klopp's announcement that he's leaving Liverpool at the end of the season, this week's bonus podcast will be a reflection on his time at Liverpool more broadly, my thoughts on his leaving and his impact on English football. So if that sounds interesting, check out the link in the description to become a Patreon member. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.